Julian is an associate professor of finance at Bocconi University in Italy. His research interests cover a wide range of topics in applied economics with a focus on corporate finance, international trade, and production networks. Julian is a prolific researcher who regularly publishes in the very best general interest economics and finance journals. He's also the associate editor for the Journal of European Economic Association and International Journal of Industrial Organization. Today, Julian will be presenting his paper on the employment effects of alleviating financing frictions, uh, worker level evidence from a loan guarantee program. Julian, welcome again. And thanks for taking out the time to present your paper at our seminar series. You have one hour and 15 minutes in total, including questions. You have the option of taking questions on the go, or you can defer them towards the end of the seminar. With that, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I think it's a great pleasure to present my work. Um, <clears throat> and of course, I uh, can try to ask me any questions during the talk. So this is uh, John Work with Jean-Noël Barrault, who is a long-term you know, co-author of mine, uh, Torsten Martin, who is a colleague at Bocconi, and Boris Vallée, that I also know from, from the PhD. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about non guarantees um, and you know, so a simple motivation for, for, for looking at them is that uh, that governments have implemented uh, these programs in many countries. Uh, now with the idea that this is often a relevant policy um, with the idea that this is often perceived as being a, a relevant policy for alleviating finance, financing constraints of firms and in particular of SMEs. And SMEs, uh, you know, they, they, they represent a large fraction of firms uh, and therefore of employment in, uh, in most countries. So, uh, and, and therefore these loan guarantee programs that target these SMEs might have, you know, a non-negligible impact on, on, on aggregate employment. So uh, it turns out that this program, they have uh, significantly expanded uh, with the financial crisis in 2008 and even more uh, with the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, recession. And so we are going to look at the program in, in during, uh, implementing during the, the 2008-09 uh, uh, recession in, in France. Uh, and it was a time where um, a lot of uh, the existing programs increased in size. And also it was a time where uh, some countries implemented new programs, created new ones. And, and, and this is going to be the case for the one that we are going to uh, look at. And so if you look at the situation today, of course, this program they have even exploded uh, with, the, with the recent pandemic. And now, you know, virtually all, all uh, developed countries have, have such a program in place. And, and I think one of the stated objectives of these programs, and again, at least for the one that we're also going to look at, was to uh, support private bank lending uh, during credit crunch, the credit crunch in financial orientation or uh, with, the, with the COVID, with the idea that this could be a good counter-cyclical policy to support employment uh, during recessions. Okay, and so this is our uh, research question. We want to know whether these programs can be effective at, uh, at preserving employment uh, uh, during recessions. We're also going to look at whether they have uh, unintended effects. And so here, we are going to face the same <clears throat> Or should I put it the same challenges that previous uh, studies have faced? In particular, of course, we need a credible uh, identification, identification strategy to uh, address selection effects and estimate the causal impact of these programs on um, unemployment. On um, but there is one difference between what typically previous studies have done and what we are going to do. So they the other work typically look at the effect of these programs or guarantees on firms' outcomes. We are going to look directly at the effect of these programs on individual workers. Okay, and in doing so, uh, we are going to shed light on the importance of labor market frictions uh, for understanding the effect of guarantees on, on, on employment. Okay, I'm going to be more precise on what we do, but just want to tell you that we are going to look directly at the effect on, on, on workers and their careers. Okay, so 
what is it that we do more precisely in this uh, project? We are going to uh, study uh, a loan grantee program implemented in France since 2009, 2010. And so the main objective, of, so the objective of this program was to uh, help firms roll over their, uh, uh, their short-term debt. So the, the idea or the intention was to target viable firms with short-term liquidity needs. Okay, and extend the maturity of their loans to allow them to survive uh, uh, during the, the financial crisis. And so <clears throat> the program was relatively big. So through the program, 5 billion of uh, additional euros have been uh, you know, guaranteed um, for, for, for SMEs. And so what we are going to do, we are going to use administrative microdata on both firms and workers, but we're going to mostly focus on workers and look at this effect of these guarantees granted in 2009-2010 on the uh, earnings and employment trajectories of workers until 2015. Okay, and, um, and, and the kind of the, rich, the richness of our data is going to allow us to decompose the effect that we observe on employment and earnings into different components. Uh, first, the effect that uh, the grant this the, the 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 grantees have on the employment and earnings that workers receive at the initial employer, so the employer in two thousand nine, but also uh, the potential earnings and employment that they get uh, um, by moving to other firms, and also the time that they spend unemployed. And so we can track we can track the employment history from uh, you know two thousand nine two thousand ten to two thousand fifteen. Okay, and so here we have two objectives in mind. First, at the micro level, understanding who in the cross-section of workers benefit the most from these guarantees. And maybe then more importantly, at the macro level, we, we want to take into account, because we can observe them, the, real, the potential reallocation of workers across firms in our computation of the cost per job or the cost benefit analysis of the policy. Okay, and so, and so here, just to be very concrete, because this is the main uh, objective of, of, of this project. So if, um, if it's easy for workers to move from one firm to another one, these uh, programs should not be, uh, should have no bite on aggregate employment because even, even if they allow some firms to survive and to retain their workers, this is not going to be very important in the aggregate because even though the worker, uh, would be fired in 2009, if it's easy for that worker to find a job in another firm, uh, then uh, these uh, programs are irrelevant uh, in, in, you know, uh, for aggregate employment. And of course, uh, you know, in the opposite case where you have uh, labor, uh, frictions on the labor market and, and, and workers do, uh, it's, it's not easy for workers to find a job when they become unemployed, then these programs by, uh, you know, can have a, a non-negligible impact on, on unemployment. On in preserving employment during during negotiations. Okay, so this is really the objective that we that we have here, and that we want on which we want to focus. Okay, so just a, a preview of uh, uh, the results. Uh, in case I don't have time to cover everything, so we are going to find that these uh, guarantees have a significant and persistent positive impact on workers' employment and uh, earnings trajectories, and in particular. Uh, this is because workers more exposed to the program are significantly less likely to separate from the from their initial employer, and when they separate, to to spend a lower amount of time unemployed. Okay, uh, so that would be on the positive uh, side, but there is kind of a negative side associated to this program, which is that workers that are less exposed to the program, therefore more likely to separate, when they find a job in another firm we find that they are more likely to move to a more productive firm. And so this is a negative impact of the program because you see it's, it is also creating some uh, rigidity on the labor market in the sense that it's preventing workers to move to, uh, uh, to more productive firms. Okay, and so you can, see as a, uh, you can see it as a negative impact of this program. Okay, then we are, I'm going to do, a, I'm going to present the cost benefit analysis of, uh, 
on this program and we're going to find a low uh, cost per job compared to other policies. So you can take other policies either in France or also in the US and we, we will typically find a, a lower cost per job. In particular, we're going to find that the cost is even negative when we include savings of the state on unemployment benefits. Okay, so just also to, uh, to tell you what we don't really do. So this is a cost per job, but this is still going to be uh, in reduced form in the sense that we are not going um, to do a full aggregate welfare analysis of these programs because uh, first, because it's mainly because it's, it's too complicated in a sense, because there are other dimensions or, or externalities that we cannot really pick up with our estimates. So in particular, you can think of, uh, because I worked a bit on this on demand externalities, the fact that by helping one firm to survive, you may uh, this is going to be a positive uh, indirect effect on or, or in the supply chain or on, on suppliers and customers. And so this is not something that we, uh, we we don't have the data to look at this. Then you can think on the negative side on fiscal externalities. The fact that to finance these guarantees, you may need to raise taxes in periods in which uh, uh the fiscal situation of the state might be uh, might be complicated and therefore this might be might have a negative effect on on the economy and so these things are not there so the cost per job is is, is simply to, to be uh, comparing the benefit in terms of uh, uh, employment with with the cost but in the employment at least we will take into account this real potential relocation of workers from one firms that uh, that are treated to other firms in the economy I think it's already uh, uh, doing. You know, we are somehow doing some progress on this on this question. Okay, in terms of uh, literature, uh, so we basically relate to uh, at least three strands of literature. So first, there is this huge now literature on the effect of capital market frictions on employment that have uh, exploded with the financial crisis. So you may know the inflation work by. Uh, here and then you have a series of, uh, of other uh, papers and more recently you have some work also looking at uh, the effect on individual workers trying to understand which workers uh, are more impacted by uh, financial shocks uh, uh, compared to others okay so then there is a, an influential also literature in, in labor on the effect of on the long-term effect of job loss for workers and they typically find a big effect, meaning that if when a worker is losing his, his job for kind of exogenous reasons, still 10 years after uh, he has or she has uh, uh, worse outcomes than, uh, than other workers. And of, of course, we contribute to this literature on, <clears throat> on you know, on the on est trying to estimate the effect of government credit on, on firms and on the economy in general. And so here I made the distinction between uh, direct public lending and indirect public lending. So direct public lending through uh, government loans. Uh, and then, so of course, one critique of this direct public lending is that maybe political considerations might be, you know, um, distorting the allocation of funds. And therefore, over time, people thought, look, um, there is maybe something better, which is to do uh, indirect subsidies through precisely these loan guarantee programs, which in theory has the advantage of, uh, uh, given that the bank is already, the private bank is a bit already in advanced uh, screening the, 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 borrower, the borrowers, maybe these programs are robust uh, to, uh, to this uh, political considerations in a sense. And so, <clears throat> Here you have a series of papers, uh, most, so they are relatively recent here. So we are going to look at uh, fresh programs, but you have uh, some people, of course, looking at the SBA in, in the US, Mullin Centro here look at the uh, guarantees in Chile. Uh, and you have all the work uh, also in the UK and so on. And of course, there are also a lot of recent papers on guarantees with the COVID associated to the COVID uh, <clears throat> crisis that I have not uh, put here, but so the list now is much, uh, is much larger. Okay, 
So let me come back to uh, what we do. So uh, this is the kind of work roadmap for the rest of the talks. I'm going to look at this. Uh, I'm going to give you some details on the design of this program that has been created again uh, uh, in 2000, announced at the end of 2008 and was implemented in 2009-10. Then uh, spend a lot of time on the identification strategy and then move to the results. And then I have this uh, you know, cost per job analysis again, using the estimates that we, that we found. Okay. So the program. So before uh, giving you details on how this uh, grant is uh, work, uh, I wanted to show you a graphical illustration of this uh, credit crunch in France. So what we have here is short-term credit to uh, non-financial firms. And what you see is uh, the credit crunch is 2009 with a big negative uh, growth rate here. So I'm plotting short-term credit because this is the main target of the program. If we were to look at total credit, we will have something uh, uh, very similar. And also the main target of the program should be short-term credit to SMEs. Uh, this comes from the Banque de France and I didn't find the SMEs versus the rest, but I guess uh, for SMEs, it would be even uh, more uh, dramatic, the drop, because typically, in recessions, they are evident that uh, banks cut first credit to, to, to small firms. Okay, and so you see the big drop in 2009, uh, then uh, um, the credit goes up again, and then you have another drop that we are not going to consider here, we're associated to the sovereign debt crisis in, in Europe. So if you were to look at, you know, at this uh, uh, graph for other countries in Europe, I guess you would find something very, uh, very similar, there is nothing specific to France here. Okay, so the program. So the program targeted exclusively short-term debt of SMEs, okay? And so banks, uh, so banks ask for the, the guarantee to the state if they want, and they can ask for the guarantee, they are eligible to the guarantee if they extend new lines of credit to SMEs between 12 and 18 months. So this is a small part of the program. If you look at the magnitude here is 4,000 firms for 1.8 billion. The total is 5 billion. Okay. And then uh, they could also ask for guarantees if they were, if they agree to restructure short-term debt, typically with a maturity below one year, this is going to be restructuring uh, credit lines typically into new, new loans with a maturity between two to seven years. And so this is a bit one specificity of this program compared to other ones at that time that was really trying to think in terms of uh, uh, extending the maturity of the loans uh, to allow firms uh, not to have to roll over their debt during the crisis. Okay, uh, so typically, of course, uh, the Policy variable, which is important in these uh, this, uh, programs, are this uh, easy this guarantee rate, and so it, it was seventy percent. So the state was reimbursing seventy percent, or the, the agency in charge of this uh, program was reimbursing seventy percent of uh, the losses in case of of default. And the counterparty of it is that the borrower uh, was paying a fee. Uh, an insurance fee equal to 1% of the, of the notional of the loan, okay? And so here, these two numbers here, it's, it's of course a way to, to mitigate, you know, uh, the potential uh, bad effects associated to this program. So first you want to make sure that uh, banks have an incentive uh, to screen borrowers. And so you don't want the guarantee rate to be 100%. You still want for, uh, banks to have skin in the game. And so here, this is one rationale for having the guarantee rate below 100%. Then there is a question of whether you know, it should be even less than 70% or not. And the interest rate here, uh, this 1% uh, fee mm -hmm. is small, but still it's here to kind of make sure that the very safe firms do not get uh, subsidized for, for nothing. So here it's uh, normally for firms that do not need uh, uh, additional debt, you know, subsidized, this 1% might be, might, might be too costly for, for asking for the guarantee. And so with the idea that the program is trying to attract the marginal uh, uh, 
Bohr. Okay, so if we look at uh, the intervention, it has been announced at the end of 2008, and it was part of the recovery plan uh, announced in France to, uh, to, to tackle the crisis. And you see these 5 billion euros, so there have been 3 billion in, uh, granted in 2009 and 2 billion in 2010, and then the program stopped. Okay. And in fact, uh, in France, they created a very similar program uh, with the, uh, just after the outbreak of the, of the, of the COVID. Julian, a quick so question. Supposed to, be, uh, uh, to be temporary. Yes, James? So, so uh, in this case, the, the figure that you're showing in say, for example, 2009, mm -hmm. this includes uh, new lines of credit and restructured loans? Yes. So would you call restructured loans as uh, uh, you know, a new uh, injection of credit or, or would that probably not be a new injection of credit? If you, if you know yes, what I Yes, you're right. And so here, yeah, so this, okay. On the restructuring part, there is another condition for getting the, the, the grantee. It was that the total credit restructure should be at least as big as uh, the the uh, the part that is restructured. But you're right that in the five billions, in fact, uh, you have uh, you know these are still new loans, but they are also you are all over. Uh, you you know uh, you mm. are mm. yes restructuring some that exists. Uh, the so how much of you know the decomposition that you have in mind? We don't really have the data to to do it because we have the total. Uh, new uh, amount that is guaranteed but it's yes yeah, so in this yeah, five yeah. sorry another question uh, sorry give me a sec well the loans given to the well the loans given to the firms or directly to the banks to the banks i mean you know the firm and the bank will discuss if uh, they, so the bank has, are, are, are asking for the guarantee on a typical loan that will be eligible to the program. Okay, and so if, and if you get the guarantee, um, <clears throat> then the bank will be reimbursed in case uh, the borrower defaults and the borrower will pay this 1% one, 1 higher interest rate uh, to the bank and the bank will give it to the fund, to the, to the guarantee fund. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. And so, just you know, I was referring at the beginning of uh, uh, probably uh, firms that have good uh, credit scores uh, would find you know this program may be too costly, you know, because you have administrative costs plus this one hundred one percent uh, higher. Uh, interest rate. And so just to, to, to have a sense of it, what I did on this graph is just giving you the probability of receiving a guarantee for a given firm, depending on its credit risk. For credit risk, I took a simple measure that you can construct from balance sheet data, which is the interest coverage ratio, uh, the sum of the interest that the firm pays over the earnings. Okay, so one is good credit score, 10 is bad credit score. And what you see is that uh, the probability of, so first around 3% of SMEs received at the end uh, during this period uh, uh, a guarantee. And you see that is almost zero for firms with good credit scores and up to 10% for firms with uh, bad credit scores. And just as a preview of what I'm going to, 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 to say, firms with very bad credit scores, like in the last uh, this side here, you have a, a, a smaller probability. And this is due to the fact that uh, these applications for guarantees were uh, screened by the agency. And one thing that the agency was supposed to do is to say, look, if a firm is already in a bankruptcy process or very close to bankruptcy, we, it's too risky and so we will reject the application. Okay, and so the, there were not strict rules, but the idea was to, you know, to accept the, the guarantee for firms that were uh, with short-term liquidity needs, but still viable. Okay, and so this is very consistent with the fact that here you have a decline. 
Okay, so what is our empirical strategy? And here I'm going to spend a bit of time. So of course here, uh, we have to address selection uh, issues in particular in an, if firms in distress are more likely to apply for guarantees, which is often the case, then in a naive OLS regression, we will estimate a negative relationship between getting the guarantees and uh, employment. Okay, and so what are we going to do for identification? For identification, we are going to expect the fact that the screening of these guarantees, of the application for guarantees, has been decentralized to regional offices of the of the agency of this public agency. Okay, and so we do observe significant variations in treatment intensity across regions. And so this is something that we're going to exploit, exploit. And so we are going to use these differences across regions and we are going then to restrict our, our attention to firms and workers along uh, regional borders in which we can check that the local economic conditions are similar on both sides of the, of the, of the borders. And so this is a way to to focus on a sample where we believe that uh, demand should be uh, uh, similar. Okay, and so this will be our restricted sample. So it will be kind of a regression discontinuity approach. And then what we are going to do, we are going to use as a proxy for exposure for supply, for exposure to the program, the average treatment intensity that we observe in the rest of the, of the region. Okay, and so our um, identification assumption here is going to be that workers in firms located on each side of the border would have experienced similar labor market outcomes in the absence of, of, of the treatment. And that the only thing that is changing on each side of the border in your, the ex, is differences in exposure to, 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 to the program. Um, so maybe let me repeat this you know, with, with the map just to to, to try to clarify what I just said. So this is France. You have uh, 21 regions, at least at that time, because then some of them merged uh, 10 years later. And the different colors uh, represent differences in treatment intensity. We're going to give you the numbers afterward, but what you see is that uh, there are differences. So in black, in thick, or within this gray area, you have the regional borders. Um, and in gray, this is our sample. So we are going to, comp to consider all workers and firms located within 10 miles of a given, uh, you know, uh, along, the, along these borders. And so this is going to be 10% of uh, French employment. Of course, you can, this 10 miles thing is ad hoc. You can change the cutoff. This is uh, what we do for robustness. But the idea here then would be to, you know, to look on a given border, take two two workers and assume, and you know, look at their uh, earnings trajectories, as you, and with the identification assumption that the only thing that is changing for these two, two workers is on which side of the border they are, and therefore uh, how uh, uh, um, the, the the intensity of the program that they were facing. Okay. So Julian, can I ask a quick one? Right. Yes. So, so the, the assumption seems to be a bit stronger, right? I mean, it's not just that they were exposed to just varying level of the loan program intensity, but any other program that was correlated with the loan program and was different across um, these borders is also incorporated in that. Yes. So thanks for raising the point. It's obviously here the main kind of threat to the identification, and so. I'm going to do a lot of things to try to convince you uh, that um, there has been other programs and other regional policies, but they are, they are orthogonal to our program. So how I'm yeah. going to do this, typically I will have, I mean, I will have my specification with and without other regional policies. I'm going to show you that the coefficients are, are exactly the, uh, the same. And I'm also going Thanks. to, I can also show you directly that our program is uncorrelated with other uh, regional policies. Uh, then, of course, uh, how should I put it? One of the weakness of this is that you can also al always think that there is one 
policies that I've not included in the in uh, in uh, my specifications. So I'm just going to show you which one I we put. We try to make our best, but uh, uh, this yeah. So this is uh, you're, you're totally right. So that's why I want to be precise on 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 uh, our unification strategy. But you you're totally right that this is the main uh, the main threat. Okay, one thing uh, in favor of this unification strategy, uh, though, is, is that the discontinuity that we are using is sharp in the sense that is the location of the firms and not of the bank that determines which of the regional offices is screening the loan. Okay, so it's not that at the border, uh, a firm can go and ask, uh, you know, uh, do the loan application to a bank you know, to, uh, in, on the other side of the border and, and get uh, and be more likely to to be accepted. Julian, a, a quick question. Yes. So in this graph, uh, this is just from my understanding. Yeah. What's your, what's your, so if you're looking at the border and, and the two region borders, uh, the two regions, for example, have very similar treatment, then is that border sample relevant for you or only those borders are relevant where you actually have a contrast? No, no, so we are going to use all, uh... All the all the borders here, so there is always a difference. But of course, okay, because it's continuous. But of course, the difference sometimes is, is small and sometimes is big. And we are going to use uh, the, the difference. Totally. Okay. Uh, let me add something else. So within regions here, uh, you have the borders for uh, département, which is an infra uh, regional. Uh, uh, you know, entity. And so what we are going to uh, do, we are going to in, in include in the regressions department uh, pairs fixed effects, meaning that we are going to compare workers on, you know, small bound of these uh, of these uh, borders here to kind of uh, uh, capture, uh, you know, local economies or local labor markets. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, we want to do. I'm going to show you the specification, the precise specification in one minute, but before this, there is a question in, in, in our project of what uh, we are really, where these uh, differences in regional intensity come from. So we don't have an answer to this because uh, the, to provide an answer to this, we would need, for instance, loan applications and rejection rates, but this is not something that we observe, okay? But the only the thing that we can say is that it looks uh, that when <clears throat> that it was related to indirectly uh, to differences in how tough these regional offices were to comply with the rule of uh, of uh, of not accepting applications from very risky firms. Okay, and how we can show it in a sense is by uh, coming back to my graph and splitting. The probability of receiving a guarantee for regions with a low treatment intensity and high treatment intensity. And what you see is that uh, typically for in regions where treatment was higher was associated with higher probability of receiving a guarantee for this uh, tip for you know for firms with relatively high uh, uh, risk that here. And so this is indirect evidence that this expansion of the program was associated with approval of, of uh, risk of borrowers. And that probably means that the officers in these regions were more lenient with, uh, with uh, accepting um, uh, the loan applications from risky borrowers. Okay, then, because of course, there is a lot of things that we try to do to commit that we are picking up supply and not uh, uh, you know, differences in demand on each side of the border. One thing is precisely to focus on the border, to have uh, already, to make it more likely that uh, uh, borders are, are very similar and therefore uh, it cannot be difference in demand, but then I'm going to show you a bit more. Okay, what is the specification? So this is a specification. We are going to uh, use a sample of workers on, this, uh, on these borders, okay? and do one observation, one, one worker, where we look at the, the dependent, main dependent variables would be cumulative employment, cumulative earnings between 2009 and 2015, regressed on 
our uh, instrument, which is the average treatment intensity in the region of uh, the worker, but in the rest of the region, not on the not on the border. And then we are going to progressively add controls. So as Tusha was uh, saying, we are going to uh, first, of course, add uh, regional controls. Okay. And then we will have controls for uh, for deep, uh, for firms characteristics and for worker level characteristics. Okay, I'm going to show you that adding these controls do not change the, the, the coefficient. And I'm, uh, we also show, um, and this is one stress of the design that uh, firm characteristics and worker characteristics are in fact, on each side of the border, uncorrelated with the treatment. Okay, and then we have our department pair uh, fixed defense. And so to come back to, to your question, so if we look at the regional control that we have in the page nine specification, uh, these are the, uh, the, uh, the, the four controls. And so we thought about, you know, the standard uh, policies that uh, could be implemented at the regional level, it could have an effect on, on the economy. So we have, you know, taxes, uh, uh, public expenditure, public debt, and state contributions to the to the regions, and you see that none of these are uh, of those are, are correlated with our uh, with our um, with our treatment. Okay, and then in robustness, we also thought about you know we were uh, uh, about other um, uh, public funding that might uh, <clears throat> play a role. So we had like structural funds from the EU for the European Union. Um, and also other, uh, another policy targeting short-term work um, that was uh, implemented at that time. And by the way, when you look at the COVID, these are the two main policies that uh, government use, you know, these loan guarantees and uh, these uh, subsidies for short-term work, or at least uh, in France and in several countries. Okay, so, <clears throat> How time do I have? 940. Okay, so data. So uh, our main uh, data, uh, we have, so this uh, BPI is a bank public investment, so the uh, public investment bank. Uh, we have all individual loans uh, granted uh, by the agency. We observe the loan amount and the share of the loss covered, which is typically 75, uh, 70%. There are small differences, but it's mostly 70%. We have no, Unfortunately, we have no information on the interest rate, uh, but we know whether uh, the loan uh, defaulted or not. And this is uh, something that we use then for the cost benefit analysis, because we are going to compare number of jobs saved by uh, through uh, the program to the cost in terms of how many loans defaulted. Okay, so when we merge these files with firm's balance sheets, uh, which are coming from uh, tax reports of firms, and we keep only uh, SMEs, which are the main, uh, which are the only firms eligible to uh, this program. Um, by the way, coming back to the threat to identification, there is something I think nice that uh, we do. That of course uh, you can run a placebo on big firms that are non-eligible, non-eligible to the state. Okay and uh, for which we find no effect of uh, where the outcomes of the workers do not re respond to the treatment, something that we find. And I think it's kind of convincing for the identification because if uh, the program was correlated with other policies affecting workers' outcomes, probably would also affect the, the, the outcomes of uh, non-eligible firms. Unless, of course, we are talking about another program that is only affecting the small firm, but it's unlikely. Okay, so we have also this placebo that is uh, including our confidence in, uh, in, in the fact that we are estimating indeed the effect of, of the program and not of something else. Okay, and so, and then we are going to restrict to firms with all employees in the same region, you know, given, it makes sense given our, our, uh, the, our setting because you, you really want to make sure that the firm uh, is exposed to only one region and not to more than one. Okay, and the main sample will be this match employer employee data set where we can track a given worker uh, over time across different employers. 
Okay, and this is matched with the balance sheet. So this is a panel. And so this is the main strength of this data. But it's only a subset of the employment registers in France that cover the whole population of workers. But these uh, employment registers, they are administrative in the sense that this is what is uh, reported by uh, firms to compute their payroll taxes. So they need to be careful into, I mean, the data is, uh, is then uh, potentially audited by, by, by the tax authority. And then four researchers, they uh, extracted a subsample of it, which covers around 10% of the French workforce. Is in fact all individuals born in October for which we can track their employment history. Okay, and this is the sample that we use. Okay, so we have, uh, you know, we focus on the, on the, along the borders. This is 10% of the sample. And here we have 10% of this 10%, so around 1% of the French workforce. At the end of the day, these are uh, our summary statistics. We have around 40,000 workers on our borders. So what do I want to uh, uh, highlight here? So, okay, the average treatment intensity is going to be 0.3. So SMEs on average receive 0.3 as new loans, granted loans as a fraction of their assets. Of course, this is small uh, because it's a mix of what has been received by SMEs indeed receiving a guarantee and other SMEs not receiving anything. So if you do it conditional, conditionally of, uh, to, to receive a, a guarantee, it will be, more, it will be around 7% of the assets that are received as guaranteed loans. What is important for us is to see that there is a huge heterogeneity of course across regions. It moved from 0 0.1 to 7, 0 0.7 across the 21 regions. In terms of uh, employment outcomes, we scale the variables to, to put them on the same uh, <coughs> scale. So years employed are really just the number of years workers has worked over between 2009 and 2015. So the maximum is seven years, okay, if you have worked all the time. And then earnings is on the same scale in the sense that we sum earnings and we divide by earnings in 2008 or the average of six, seven, eight. So it's, it's on the same scale. It's as a fraction of pre-crisis earnings. And unemployment benefits. Uh, so this is also one strength of, of this data, typically, you do not observe them. So here we observe the employment benefit that workers get and it's as a fraction of earnings. Okay, so then you have characteristics on average earnings in France, 24,000 and the age uh, 38 of the workers. Okay, and then you have uh, characteristics on firms and you see number of employees, uh, the on average 20 employees who are talking about small firms. Uh, some of the statistics that is important is that at the end of the day, we have 5% of our workers here that are treated, meaning working for a firm, receiving a guarantee. Okay, let me move on to the results if you don't have uh, any questions. So this is our first stage. The first stage is simply to make sure that indeed there is a correlation between uh, what firms on the border receive as guarantees uh, and uh, the average treatment intensity for other SMEs in the same region, but not on the border, okay? And if our identification study works, we should find something close to one in the sense that you, on average on the border, you should receive uh, grant the same amount of guarantees and other SMEs in the rest of the region. And so you see, it's highly statistically significant. It's not one, but it's close to one. Uh, if you know uh, these guarantees were uh, driven by differences in demand, there would be no reason to, to see um, to see a, a, a positive coefficient here. Okay, because on the border firms are similar on each side of the border, and so there is no reason uh, that it should be corrected with the rest of the region, region if it were driven by only. Uh, by demand. Julian, uh, okay. a quick question. So out yes. here, the, your X variable is the guarantee intensity in the region excluding? Uh, yes. Okay. Excluding the firms on, uh, on our border. 
So I'm just curious, what happens if you do the same, but with you know the region that's on the other side of the border? Do you do you see a zero coefficient because, or, or is it positive, or or is it the same? I'm not sure. I understand with the on the other side because here I'm always comparing. The other side is always here because it's like uh, is a guarantee of the firm with the guarantee. I can always attach a firm to, to the guarantee rate is on region and is compared uh, to the guarantee rate on the other side because I have my department pair fixed effects. I see, I see. Um, just another thing for that I want to show you is of course, uh, what we have in mind is that uh, the difference should be driven by firm that are financially constraints constraint and not all the firms. So here we do a subsample of this first stage, uh, but for firms uh, that are financially constrained, as we saw there, of course, in corporate finance, difficult to have good proxies for financial constraints, but here we can use having low or high credit risk, paying or not dividends, and having high or low cash flows. And you see that uh, we have a coefficient which is close to one and no, uh, and no effect in the other group. So we have we see that the effects are driven precisely by the subgroup of financially constrained firms, which are the one uh, that should respond to the, to the problem. Okay, I want to uh, move soon to, to my workers, but this is uh, still kind of first stage regressions where we want to see if it's really driven by supply. So if our effects are driven by supply, what, what is the program supposed to do? The program is supposed to be associated with an increase in uh, bank debt, okay? More because, uh, <clears throat> because the guarantees are, made, are, are, are given for firms, uh, you know, uh, asking for new loans. And at the same time, we should, so we should observe higher exposure being associated with an increase in debt and at the same time in, an in a decrease in the interest rates. While if the results were driven by an increase in the demand for new loans, you should see an increase in quantities in bank debt and an increase in interest rates. Okay. And so what you see here is that higher exposure is indeed associated with more, more debt and with lower interest rates, which is consistent with a credit supply shock and inconsistent with uh, you know, a credit demand shock. So this is another way to double check that we are indeed picking up a shift in the, in the supply of, of loans. Okay, so this is now, I can move to uh, my, uh, so here you had like 24,000 observations because one observation was one firm. Now I move to our, my sample of workers. Okay, so I have my 40,000 uh, workers here and I'm regressing the total number of years employed between 2009 and 2015 on my treatment in reduced form. And I have my four specifications where I, you know, progressively add the regional controls, uh, 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 ta uh, local taxes, public debt, and so on and so forth. The firm level controls, firm size, firm age, and worker level controls, age, uh, gender, uh, the type of the contract, and so on and so forth. And so here we have a positive coefficient, meaning being more likely to receive the guarantees associated with better uh, labor outcomes over a long uh, period of time. I'm going to show you then the dynamics, but I just want to talk about the magnitude here. We have a coefficient of 0 0.3, 25 here. The average treatment intensity in the average region is 0 0.3. Okay, so if you were to compare uh, the average region with an hypothetical reg uh, region without guarantees, it would be uh, that the, av the average guarantee treatment in the average region is, is associated with an additional 0 0.07 years of employment per worker over that period. Of course, this number doesn't mean much. And so what you can do is to uh, extrapolate this number to workers of treated firms. How we do this? Well, we know that uh, there are 5% of the worker that indeed were working in 
a firm receiving in a, a guarantee. So you can just pick this number and divide by 5% to get you know, the treatment effect of really receiving a guarantee. And that will give you uh, an additional 1.5 years of employment on the period 2009-2015. So this is relatively big. Uh, Wait, J Julian, isn't yes. that like, so, so what you have in mind is, well, the average treatment effect of on the treated that you calculated there, right? That mm -hmm. if you receive it, right? But, but from a policy point of view, like isn't your, the first estimate more useful, right? Uh, that overall, how much money do we pump in and how much does it affect the economy overall, right? Yeah, you're totally right. And so it's, uh, you're totally right in the sense that what we are going to do in our, in our cost benefit analysis, you know, we will in fact take this first, uh, the estimate of 0 0.26 that we see here, um, or this 0 0.07, sorry, and multiply by the number of, uh, of uh, workers in SMEs in France. And this is going to give us the effect on the economy. But I just wanted oh, uh, to also bring this number on the table because this is what is more easy to interpret across studies, like uh, what is the effect on, on a given firm or a given worker that really receive a, a grant. But you're totally okay. correct. So earnings, we find slightly bigger coefficients. So remember, I've scaled earnings to be on the same scale as employment. So if, you, if we see that the coefficient is slightly higher, it means that also earnings per year employed as a bit uh, uh, has increased a bit. But when we compute it, the effect is positive, but not uh, statistically significant. So it turns out that the effect on earnings are in fact driven by the, by the uh, intent, um, extensive margin, the fact that uh, these programs uh, allow firms to uh, allow workers to work more and spend less time unemployed. Okay, but we don't really have a, a, an effect on wage per hour. Okay, and then uh, we can look at the dynamics. So these are the effect on uh, each year earnings of the worker. And so what you see, the, the implementation of the policy is here at the end of 2008. And so we have no effect before, which is uh, reassuring for you know, uh, the validity of our design. And then uh, uh, we have, uh, if, statistically significant effect on each year earnings. And so the coefficient that I've shown you before is just, you know, the sum of this, uh, of this estimates over the period 2009 to 2015. Then we can look at separation, or we could have looked at it uh, uh, before. And so here yeah, the probability of being separated from uh, your uh, initial employer, and you see, uh, you know, uh, a, a significant effect in particular in 2009 and 10, and then uh, it stabilizes over time, which is kind of indicating that the, uh, the, the program is mostly protecting uh, employees from being uh, fired from the, their employers during this, uh, during the crisis. Okay, now uh, these are the effects on employment benefits. Okay, so that you receive scaled by uh, pre-worker earnings. And so here you see a negative effect, meaning negative, negative coefficient, meaning that uh, being uh, in regions more, more intensely be treat, treated is associated with a lower probability of receiving unemployment benefits. And this is one of the main benefit for the state in the sense that uh, the policy is associated with uh, lower unemployment benefits given to, to, to workers. And then you can compare this number to the effects on earnings, and we find that unemployment benefit replaces one fourth of the loss in earnings. Okay, so the differences in earnings that we found in the previous table, there is one fourth of it which is uh, mitigated by the unemployment benefit that uh, workers in low treatment intensity, low treatment intensity regions receive. I hope what I just said is, is, is clear. Um, okay, then we have a lot of tables on, uh, on the robustness and, uh, and validating our, our, our empirical strategy. So this is, I think, the most convincing table, which is a placebo on workers from non-eligible firms. So 
we focus on big firms on the on these borders okay and look at their workers outcomes and you see basically no effects on your employed and, and earnings okay so here if the if something was correlated with our treatment probably it would also show up here and we don't see anything we have additional tests where we look, uh, where we double check that indeed firms and workers' characteristics are the same in 2008, just before uh, the announcement of the program, that these regions with low and high treatment intensity were not different along other uh, characteristics, in particular on their, uh, on their GDP growth, local GDP growth. This business stealing effects, I think, is important. So, of course, here we have to think of potential spillovers. And one potential spillover is that our estimates are, in fact, maybe uh, overestimating the true effect of the program if they are local uh, competition, meaning uh, you, are look, uh, you are a restaurant, you receive the guarantee, and you will uh, steal market shares to your competitor on the other side of the border. If this is the case, then we would our coefficient would overestimate the true effect of the guarantee. And so what you can do to double check that this is not the case is to compare our estimates in tradable industries and non-tradable industries, because this local business stealing effect should be here only for uh, non-tradable industries, hotels, uh, bars, and restaurants. For tradable industries, the competition is national. And so, you know, by comparing the two, you can see the degree of business delay effect that uh, we are picking up with, uh, with our estimates. And then we have uh, more boring stuff, which is, you know, you change the cutoff uh, for, for, the, for the sample, you exclude regional pairs with Ile de France where Paris is because maybe everything is driven by uh, the difference between Paris and the rest. And you can also control for other factors at the regional effect, uh, uh, regional level. So this, I was talking about this, let me just show you the, Exactly. The other policies uh, that you can take into account, the EU funds, short-term work, also differences in, uh, um, in, in uh, you know, if, if the regions is, go, uh, is run by uh, the left or the right party. And, and typically when we put these uh, <coughs> variables, so the estimates are also uh, very similar. Okay, so I have uh, 15 minutes left. So let me move to these adjustment margins, which are uh, an important part of, uh, of, our, of our overall analysis of, of this world. So what do we do here? So we can, we have a match employer employee data set. So again, we can decompose the earnings and the employment that workers get between 2009 and 2015, between what they get at the initial employer in 2008, and how much they get later on if they move to another firm. Okay. And so here I'm plotting different coefficients for years employed and cumulative earnings. The first coefficient here is the one that we have seen in the previous tables, is the total effect on years employed and cumulative earnings. And I'm decomposing this effect into, in column two and three, what Exposure to the program uh, gives in terms of additional years employed and earnings at the initial employer. And what you get by moving to other firms, when you move to other firms, when you don't move is zero. Okay, so the sum of the coefficient in column two and three is equal to the first coefficient. What does that mean? This coefficient is bigger and the effect is negative at other firms. It means that, um, working in a firm in a more intensively treated regions, you receive, you are less likely to separate from your initial employer and therefore you get more than firms on the other, than workers on the other side of the border. But the counterpart of it is that firms in the counterfactual, so, so in regions less intensively treated, are also more likely to precisely be separated and work for other firms. Okay, and this is a negative sign. So being more treated means that you also are less likely to work for other firms. 
Just to come back to my motivation, if you were to look at the effect of these programs on aggregate employment by focusing only on treated firms, we would observe a much higher effect because employment of treated firms is the, co the coefficient in the second column. And so we would, if we were to extrapolate the effect on aggr aggregate employment from column two, we would estimate a much bigger effect of the program. What we also observe is that when workers lose their job, okay, they also tend to move to other firms. And so this is reducing uh, the total effect of the program on aggregate employment. And you see by how much here, we, the, the, this reallocation of the workforce toward other firms is, is how I should I put it, eating one half of the effect. You see, the effect at the initial employer is twice bigger than the total effect on the, on the workers. So it's true that they are less likely to be unemployed, but it's also true that they also tend to find jobs elsewhere. And so it's the strength of this employer-employee image data set is that you can precisely track this, the reallocation toward other firms. So okay. in a hypothetical scenario, uh, if there are no uh, frictions, your, your aggregate coefficient would, would have been zero. This coefficient would have been zero, exactly. And uh, you, we would have found an effect potentially on initial firm that would have been perfectly compensated by uh, uh, the effect on other firms. And so, yes, exactly. By comparing the two, you have a sense of uh, the role of frictions on the labor market in our, uh, you see, in, the, in driving the effect of guarantees on aggregate employment. This is exactly, so is that, it's, in some sense, is the main table of, of the paper. The other thing that we can do then is to then split this coefficient on other firm into types of firms. And so one thing that we do, we separate between when you move to another firm, is it a productive or high productivity or low productivity firm? What you can do is, you know, to define whether it's high productivity or low productivity based on the productivity of the initial employer. So you take the initial employer and then you say, if you move to a firm with a higher productivity in terms of value added over employees or TFP. This is a difference between this colon four, five, six, seven. Uh, I can, you know, I can re regret then the years employed cumulative earnings in firms with higher or lower probability productivity than your initial employer. And what you see here, so again, the coefficient in colon four and five is equal to the coefficient in colon three and coefficient in colon six and seven is equal to the uh, coefficient column three. And you see that the effect is significant and negative only in firms with higher productivity, which means that when workers of, are separated in low uh, treatment intensity regions, when they move to another firm, they tend to move to a firm with a higher productivity. And so this is a, one cost of this program, which is that you are reducing the efficient reallocation of workers towards more productive uh, firms. And this is my, uh, you know, our reading of this table. So maybe without the program, uh, workers would have spent more time unemployed, but they would also have uh, more easily uh, be reallocated towards uh, more, productive, more productive firms. And so this is an important cost of, uh, of, of, of this program. Okay, um, what else do we do? Well, we can also look something else, huh? but we can also look in the cross section of workers, what are the workers that benefit the most from these guarantees? And so here you can do different split. We have tried many gender, uh, age, wages. Uh, you can do it by industry, but then the sample becomes too small. We found in fact differences kind of significant differences along, uh, only along the wage, total uh, wage margin, meaning that high wage workers tend to benefit more than low wage workers from, from, from the grants. For the other groups, we didn't find much. How do we do this? <clears throat> so we can, um, these are subsamples. So this is high wage workers, low wage workers, and I report the coefficient on uh, the total, the total on the total effect, and also the coefficient on the effect only at the initial firm. Why I'm doing this? 
because in fact, by looking at the two coefficients, we can understand better the sources of why we observe a difference across workers. Because some workers can benefit more from the program than others for two reasons. One is because maybe high wage workers, um, treated firms might be more likely to retain some types of work of workers compared to others. Maybe, you know, when they receive a guarantee, they are more likely to retain uh, the high skill workers and, and still fire the others. It's one reason that why we can observe differences. The second reason is even if retention policies of firms are the same for high and low skilled workers, when the two types of workers become unemployed, it might be easier for a given type to find a job versus another. Okay, and so differences in the effect could be driven by either differences in retention policies at the initial employer or differences in uh, the friction that they face on the labor market. Maybe for one group or the other, being fired is not very important because one group can easily find a job elsewhere while another group will, type of worker will remain unemployed forever. Okay, and so uh, this is why we are comparing these two coefficients. And so what you see, is that um, it looks like the effect is stronger, positive effect of guarantees is stronger on the career earnings trajectories of high wage workers compared to low wage workers. This high, all firms uh, coefficient is not statistically significant for your sample, but it is for cumulative earnings. And that this difference seems to come from dif uh, differences already at the initial firm meaning that it seems to be driven by differences in retention policy, policies within the initial employer that tend to probably uh, be more likely to retain their high skill workers when, uh, when they survive. We did the same for young versus old uh, workers and we don't see much of the difference. We have a slight positive effect, higher effect for young workers, but it's not statistically significant. Okay, but this is the kind of analysis that, that uh, we can do. Now, let me move on for the last you know, minutes that I have on the cost per job analysis. So how do we do this? Uh, as I already uh, said before, we can take our you know, main coefficient that the average treatment intensity is associated with an increase is 0 0.07 years of employment per worker. Multiply this number by the number of workers at SMEs at small firms in France 2008 is 4 million. You multiply the two and we get uh, the, an estimate for the number of jobs saved uh, through, uh, through the program. And we get something which is 270,000 jobs. To have a cost per job, which is what is typically computed uh, by uh, studies you know, in, uh, in labor, we can divide this by uh, the exposed realized default on guaranteed loans. So we have this information. So we can compute the cost per job, ex ante or ex post. Ex post is based on the total default that are uh, in incurred by the program. And ex ante would be, you know, the initial budget of the fund, which is much higher. So you can use the two numbers to get a range for the cost per job, either from an ex ante or ex post perspective, which is, but which is, we find that is typically, which is very low between 800 and 2,500 uh, per, per job. We know it's very low in the sense that you can compare it to other uh, programs. So there is uh, one paper in uh, the review of economic studies that does compute the cost per job for hiring credits. So it's something different because um, it was you know, a subsidy if, if you were to hire someone else, while uh, guarantees is more to preserve your, your existing workforce. But they find something which is low, eight, eight, bigger, but still kind of low, 8,000 euros per job. And then when you, if you look at the US, you have uh, one paper on uh, the SBA loan program during the financial, um, precisely not during the financial crisis, more in a gross period between 2000 and 2008, I think they do. 
and they get something which is uh, uh, 25,000 per for three years, so it's also 8,000, sorry. And then you have uh, other estimates for the American Recovery uh, Act. Okay, just to tell you that the estimate that we find is kind of uh, low compared to the studies. And then you can, we can also bring on the table the savings on employment benefit that, you can, that we can compute. And when we compute them, in fact, is, is the, the states saved more in terms of unemployment benefit than uh, what was the cost of, uh, of total default on the program. And so this maps into a negative cost per job uh, for, for this. And in this slide, uh, just to want it also. So I, we find that a cost is of the program is precisely that it prevents the relocation of workers towards more productive firms. So we, for the moment, didn't find a way of precisely you know, putting it this directly in our estimate for the cost per job, but we compute it in a separate way. And so we found that this net preservation of 270,000 jobs is in fact a sum of 6, 600,000 jobs preserved at initial employers minus the counterfactual decline. So the fact that the, wor the workers that lost their job, they also found a job somewhere else at more productive firms. Okay, and if you were to really put the same number, uh, the, this, to put the cost of this, we would need to know uh, by how much society benefit when a worker works for a more productive firm than you were for the initial employer to map with the cost per job. So this is not something that we do, we do this. Uh, separately, but maybe there is a way of uh, bringing these two numbers on the same scale. Okay, uh, let me conclude. Uh, we find that uh, these uh, workers at firms receiving loan guarantees during the financial crisis in France experience uh, more uh, higher earnings, higher employment and earnings on uh, the, the long run, meaning you know over a seven year period at least. But it also curves uh, worker reallocation toward uh, more productive firms. The cost per job is small and is even negative when we include the savings and employment benefits. So it seems that uh, overall, these guarantees might be a cost effective policy for uh, supporting employment in downturn, in downturns. Okay, so thanks a lot uh, for you know, your questions. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks a lot, Julian. Um, any questions? Uh, I have a few, if that's, if nobody sure, else. Sure, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I think uh, uh, let's make the usual disclaimer that uh, since the time is officially over, let's officially end the seminar. But uh, if, if Julian has time, he can, he can uh, answer the questions that people may have. So sure, go ahead. Yeah, so Julian, uh, the first thing I was wondering is that you, you touched on this a bit with your placebo analysis, but there has to be, there has to be a, borderline where a firm is basically categorized as an SME or an LME, right? I mean, there has to be a discontinuity there as well. Maybe 100 workers is the limit, 150 is the limit. I was wondering, is it possible to extend your empirical specification to have like a third difference, but instead of showing it as a placebo, you just compare low, uh, small uh, manufacturing enterprises with low, uh, large manufacturing enterprises. So, so, so that was my first you know, question. The second one was, I was wondering that it, this effect that you find is basically like right now, it seems to me that the, the theory you have in mind is the firms are able to sustain like, you know, downturn better. And that's why they keep the employment going. Uh, is it possible that there's also an efficiency wage uh, effect here that if these people would have not received the, the benefit of being employed, the productivity would have taken a toll or it was already going down, but with this additional boost, now they are product, more productive at the same firm that they were, they were working before. And, and you talk about the low rates of separation. Now, one thing we know about efficiency wages that does exactly that, right? I mean, firms, uh, workers don't want to quit their jobs because they think this is a good gig that I have here, right? So I was wondering if there's any way of, you know, shedding some light on that. And finally, like the, 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 there are two related parts to, the, to this, is that 
there's a there's a mechanism story that you can tell because even within a district or a province, you have borders that are shared with different different regions, right? So within the same province, you have different levels of intensity of the demand side, right? So at different borders, you have different levels to which you are equalizing the demand. So you can actually compare what's the effect across the different borders that one state has on how it affects your treatment. I, I don't know if I articulated it correctly, but if you go back to the map, I can I can like and I can explain it better that for one particular region, sharing borders with more than one region. Yes. Right. So let's take the, the darkest one in red here, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In the center. It shares borders with five different regions. Yeah. Right. And so basically you can estimate an effect, the five different effects for the same, same uh, region, right? And that will tell you to what extent the demand side is a factor because the demand side shock that you're talking about around the border is different depending on which border we are looking at. Yeah, so up to now, I don't know if I'm answering with this, I have this uh, department pairs fixed effect. So I'm really comparing all the time only with, uh, you know, holding fixed at the other side. Uh, but I, but uh, to come back to your, um, to your other uh, question, so I totally agree. So we tried and in fact it works, but uh, then we didn't want to, to change all the specification, meaning you were telling me at the beginning, what you can do is to stop doing, for instance, a regression discontinuity at the border, keep the eligible and non-eligible firms and compare, you know, the difference between eligibility, non-eligibility times uh, the treatment intensity. This is uh, or a third. So what you can do here, you can absorb the region because you can put a region fixed effect and compare eligible versus non-eligible firm. Yeah. Um, so I totally take this, uh, you know, this idea, and it's also something that uh, that we we did, and it, it also it also works because, in fact, uh, you know, more or less the difference in coefficient that we find between our placebo and the, the others. Um, the cutoff for France is two hundred fifty employees for being uh, for being. Uh, an SME. But uh, yes, thanks for the comment. And then, in terms of you were talking about e efficiency wage, so. Yeah, so in terms of theory, there are different ch channels, uh, but we don't really try to, it would be interesting eh, to, to know a bit uh, better. And then there's a question of how you test it. So first, we had more in mind this uh, labor hoarding. Of course, the fact that uh, if you think that the shock is temporary, then it might be good to allow firms to survive because they will not fire and rehire workers. Yeah. You were mentioning efficiency wage. And we have not thought so much about it, but I think it's a good suggestion. So how we could take this, I guess, it has to be that the wage uh, goes up, no? That the firms can, or that they would have reduced the wages. In the absence of, yeah. Exactly. So here, two things on, on this, but uh, we, we can uh, do more. First, we don't have, uh, estimate much on the wage per hour. Mm -hmm. And also, I think in France, wages are extremely rigid downward. So it's almost impossible to decrease the wage of a worker. Uh, and so I don't think that is something that, you know, have a lot of bite in this particular context. Yeah, fair. But thanks. It was, uh, yeah. But thanks a lot for the question. Any other questions? No. So I, I'll ask uh, maybe the last question then, uh, Julian, then. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I think a key point of your analysis is uh, the idiosyncrasy of uh, the heterogeneity in the treatment. Uh, and it, it'd be good to see maybe uh, a little more on that in the sense, maybe if you, if you have some, you know, generic controls of say the banks, uh, you know, the leverage ratio, the capital, Etc. Uh, and also, if you have some characteristics of the public body, you know, the decentralized public, you know, you, you were saying that the decentralized units that are making these decisions together with the private banks. So if you have um, information on bank characteristics and these decentralized units of 
uh, you know, the public sector that's actually making this decision. Uh, and then show that uh, even after purging out these effects, the treatment, the you know, the, the difference in the the intensity maintains is maintained. Then I think that goes to show that at least with whatever you can observe, uh, and even after controlling and purging that out, uh, basically intensity is is different and it's varying, and that you cannot explain you know heterogeneity in treatment with what you can observe. So I think that'll go. Uh, in in bolstering what you're saying that it's idiosyncratic. Um, yeah. So it's exactly what uh, we were trying to do, but uh, we can uh, try to include even more variables. So here, what you see is, you know, we have this regional bank lending. Uh, so we took this, uh, given the national banks are everywhere, but maybe, you know, there are regional banks that might uh, end their you know, the health that they have might have correlated with the, 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 so we put the change in this regional bank total lending as a control, and you see that it doesn't change, but of course we can do more. Here is total credit, we could put, you know, capital ratios, uh, we can do much more than this. And I totally agree that maybe there is a way to see, you know, the size of the local uh, uh, government of the region. For the moment, the only thing that we have is this, uh, you know, left party vote share, so it's not directly what you say, but uh, you know we could do more then, and uh, do uh, something that we did. Where is it? Okay, but I don't find it. But like you know, here the way of we control one by one. But you can also do uh, a version where you residualize the treatment by taking the treatment on all these variables, take the fixed effect, and put it there. And so this is a specification that we have, but. You know, in this specification, we could add what you said uh, more on this uh, thing, and that would be very close to what uh, what you are saying. But thanks a lot. So, yeah, I agree that uh, it's yeah. the best way. To do it. Excellent. Then, well, I think uh, if there are no questions, we can end the seminar. Um, Julian, thanks a lot again for a very interesting presentation and a paper. And uh, yeah, all the best. <laughs> thanks a lot. Girish, if, if Julian is uh, free, then can can I go ahead and ask a couple of trivial questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sure, why not? Julian, are you are you available? Uh, so, yeah, uh, sure. Kushana, just, just a uh, quick clarification. So, I'm having a quick chat now. Uh, yeah. uh, it, it, okay, are, okay. Are these, are no these quick about. questions or uh, would you... I, I, I can email you? him later. Okay, cool. cool. Yeah, Tushar, I'm happy to, 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 uh, meet, to meet eh, if you want after, uh, you know, with the Zoom or something. Yeah, well, I, I have to run right now, but I'll definitely write you an email and uh, fix the meeting. Yeah, but what, what, one quick question before I go was basically, I'm, I'm finding it somewhat difficult to believe that the effect, like, you know, you're, you're fitting an OLS right now, that the effect is linear throughout, right? And I think the, the, it's really nice that you have that credit score, right? And I think if you did a non-parametric fit, you might find that towards the far edge of it, the very risky firms, which actually ended up getting the guarantee anyway, they might not be, you know, that that might not be that good a plan, you know. And so you can actually find out the optimal point, the credit risk score beyond which this is not a good plan, before which this is a good plan. And that from a policy point of view goes really, really far. Nice, yes, yes. yes. Like doing subgroup analysis depending on the exante credit score of these firms. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that might be one way of doing it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. I'll write to you with other comments that I have. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Tushar. Thanks. And thanks, thanks to all of you. Thanks, Girish. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. bye.